A is for Alcoholic is a program about recovery. My name is John, and I'm an alcoholic. And my name is Jerry, and I'm an alcoholic. Join us as we go through the alphabet of alcoholism one letter at a time. So before we get started, a couple of quick housekeeping things, if you don't mind, Jerry. <laughs> Please, clean the house. So, clean it up. Clean it up. Uh, first, I wanted to thank our uh, newest Patreon member. Um, you can find him on Instagram at, at @personalbest. If you like to see pictures of steak and lobster dinners and uh, the mountains and, and shores of Kauai, he does great pictures on there. So Hell he was, uh, yeah. yeah. So if yeah. you want to be a part of the uh, A's for Alcoholic Community, patreon.com slash A-I-F-A. We would love to have you. Come check it out. Jerry's working on some playlists and yeah. we are going to do am. all kinds of other stuff. Like I said, we've got, um, there's some interviews on there and some bonus content as well. So please join us there. I'd also like to introduce our first sponsor. And full disclosure, this is my other company that I'm working on, uh, Green Camel Press, greencamelpress.com. Uh, we do design, we do uh, Christmas cards, we do greeting cards, we do all kinds of cards, um, but we are going to be putting out a series of Christmas cards this year. I am in the works right now with finishing the designs, so greencamelpress.com, there's an Etsy store, there's a Facebook page, Instagram, all that good stuff. So please go check it out. Um, super cool things. Okay. Yeah. So I got nothing. <clears throat> you I'm got... not doing anything. No, no, no notes. You're not... I'm sponsored by Red Dead Redemption 2 <laughs> and uh, not doing art. <clears throat> playing and, video uh, games instead of playing, art. I, playing video games instead of uh, expressing myself creatively and, and counting calories. Well, you got that. You got that nice uh, purse, that buffalo purse, right? That's... Man, the stupid buffalo fell in the water. Yeah, I'm not even gonna. <laughs> I really needed that purse to keep my pine cones mm, in. Excuse me. Um, so I wanted to. <laughs> so this week is S, letter S. We're already there. Um, yeah. Wow. And uh, I wanted to do. We thought about it, and we were gonna we're gonna do the signs of alcoholism. And um, I'd also like to say that I am not a doctor. Um, I don't think that, you know, you should take anything that we say here as clinical proof or, you know, facts. I think that most cases, or I should say the ones that I have come in contact with, alcoholics, they're pretty much all been self-diagnosed. You know, yeah. people come to this of their own conclusion. And I think that that's a part of why recovery works for people when it does, because they've chosen to say, hey, I got a problem. Yeah. You know, so um, this is by no means a condemnation of people. And, you know, it's really something you got to you got to figure out on your own, or at least it was for me, because <clears throat> I think I knew a lot of these signs already. But so S is for signs of alcoholism. Shall I start, Jerry? Are you ready? Sure. Yeah. yeah so I mean... um, they broke this up. I got this off of a website called quitalcohol.com but there's any number of places where you can go and see signs of alcoholism and stuff like that but the first one was a social sign of alcoholism is that you have trouble with the law mm -hmm. and my favorite quote from here was um it says if the law is aware of your drinking you may well be an alcoholic <laughs> <laughs> i, I think like, if the law is aware of anything you do and you're kind of fucking up a little bit you right? know like, i was like if chp yeah. knows about you know the wine that i drink you know the level of of intoxication then yeah and right you know we we like to joke on the podcast because i mean because this stuff is is funny but it's very very serious too but it's it's you know, like I think about people who have talked to me and they're like, hey, man, I was just at the bar and blah, blah, blah and this, that and the other. And I just hear this string of excuses as to why they got pulled up, picked up or or whatever it was. And, right. you know, you just you knew you weren't supposed to be where you were at. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking from experience with somebody I know and. And they were really angry and they were really upset. And they were like, I wasn't even drinking. I was just there getting a cheeseburger. And where am I supposed to shoot pool at? And it's like, well, maybe you don't get cheeseburgers and shoot pool until your court date. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> That's. Oh, man. So I don't know if you've had any run-ins with the law. 
I did, yeah. Uh, but I was a teenager. I don't know if I was in full blown alcoholism yet. I was like mm-hmm. a little baby fledgling alcoholic. I was like really starting to like figure out, I guess, how to be an alcoholic. But that was more for graffiti stuff. Mm-hmm. I was low key. I was pretty. I was pretty low key, man. I was like one of the drunk sheep in the back who was just kind of running with the herd. Um, I used to brag for years. I probably told this story in the podcast, but I bragged for years that I wasn't a real alcoholic because I never had a DUI. And then my wife mm-hmm. piped up one night and was like, "You don't know how to drive, dude. That's why you don't have a <laughs> DUI." So that was. And your, I was like, your, "Oh, proud moment." <laughs> I was like, shit, I guess you're right. I don't, yeah, my proud moment was that, you know, I've, I've never injured myself rock climbing and they're like, you don't know how to rock climb. You don't know how to drive, Jerry. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, my trouble with the law, I have almost had the cops called on me a few times. I've definitely yeah. acted out in alcoholism. You've almost called the cops on me at mm-hmm. least once or twice. Me, You know, I've definitely, there have been moments in my life where police intervention probably was imminent. It just, I don't know, man. I got lucky. Yeah, I got I've, really lucky. I yeah. did too. I had several scrapes. I've been pulled over while intoxicated, mm-hmm. and talked my way out of it. And there's yeah. no reason that I shouldn't have been hauled in right then and right there. And right. I was just, you know, for whatever reason, the guy let me go. He gave me a ticket, and that was it. Yeah. You know, I, he's like. That was it. Carry on. He's you like, were like you... a drunken Jedi. Mm. You were like, this is, I am not the drunk you're looking for. Seriously, man. It was something yeah. else. I was really, I was rattled until he got to the window and I was like, this is where you got to put it on. And I'm not, right. I'm not proud of that moment. And I'm not saying that's something to be proud of. I mean, I certainly, no. I think that if I would have gotten pulled over, I might very well have gotten sober sooner. So. But that's definitely one of those one of those signs. But, but yeah, if you're at home, right? Yeah, if you're at home and you're like, "Damn, dude, the cops know my name. <laughs> <laughs> they keep coming to the house and shit, mm-hmm. and I keep getting popped." And they're like, "Yo, so and so, you know, yeah, too many Bud Light really, limes. Really reassess your situation there, yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that one seems to be one of the most obvious ones, right. though, you know." Yeah. So this is another one they call crooked priorities, which I like because, you know, when they talk about people have their priorities straight. And so the idea is, you know, alcohol should never take priority over anything else in your life as an adult. You know, I mean, what you do as a kid there, I think there's a certain level of excusability depending on the situation. But I mean, it shouldn't be like, well, I'll pay the rent late because I'm going to go ahead and get wasted tonight, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's, if you are, I I know that I certainly did that. I can remember one time where I was like, fuck it. And my rent was super cheap. I was living in that tiny flea bag studio in downtown Seattle. The one I think. Oh, the the Rivoli. Yes. Yeah, dude. The one that was haunted. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Creepy. So creepy. And, um, I remember one night going, fuck it. Let's buy a round of tequila shots for everybody. I'll pay my rent late. And yeah. I was like, that's not a that's not a good priority. I right. was like 23 or 24, and I thought that was fine. Well, or like how many wed- uh, how many like parties and weddings have I left like pissed off like for real that the bar wasn't an open bar mm-hmm. and I had to blow all my fucking cash so I could have a quote unquote good time and feel okay. Or like you know, going to help out, I had to help a family member move once, and uh, I thought I would get paid for helping a family member move, and they didn't help me, or they didn't pay me, and I was, like, pretty bummed out because I needed that, any of that money, not for bills, but to get a fifth afterwards, you know? Mm-hmm. And I remember having to hit my dad up for money so I could buy a fifth, man, and I couldn't even imagine <clears throat> what he was sitting there thinking, driving me to CVS so I could buy some CVS liquor, you know, the $10 <sighs> fifth of fucking, sh- it's not even real bourbon, it's just vodka with bourbon flavoring you know but Gross. anyway those priorities your pri- i think that's a great sign because you once your priorities shift from taking care of yourself and it's not even about like paying bills to keep up appearances like it's just paying for these things to have the general normal things in life that keep you from dying Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know like rent and heat and electricity and shit and, and yeah people can tell you oh, i can live with all that, that without all that shit but it's just like, what a fucking existence man and maybe you, you know? can but these things are cumulative you don't do one thing and then another thing goes and then another thing oh, goes God. and yeah it's the way it's set up man 
it's it's definitely mess. the way it's set up yeah so it's <laughs> yeah when alcohol is the priority i mean yeah if you're else. yeah if if you're uh, if you're buying a you know if you're paying for a fifth of that pop off vodka instead of paying your fucking electric bill it, it definitely you should reassess it might yeah too. i mean you might want to grab a flashlight and reassess things in your life That's, yeah it's time to camp in the house right <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to reiterate exactly what we said at the end of every one. Just, yeah, you know what I was thinking, actually, this mm. whole science thing reminded me of the Jeff, Fo- Jeff Fox where they're like, you might be a redneck. Like, you might be an alcoholic. <laughs> you might be an alcoholic if. Yeah. That's if, good. If while you're breathalyzer, the cop calls you by your high school nickname, you know, like. <laughs> you should write some jokes, man. Oh, yeah. Just, that would be my stand up career. <laughs> we'll but it'll just end with me yelling at everybody. I got to go. This is fight. I just fucking bison fell in the water. <laughs> Number three here is um, this is uh, this is a pretty obvious one, uh, but affected relationships. Oh yeah. So, <clears throat> I, um, I think every single relationship before the one that I'm in has been affected by my active alcoholism, one hundred percent. So. Um, yeah. simply I, the, the only thing I can say is that I, I wasn't capable of being a, a decent and good human being to myself. So how could I ever be capable of being a decent and good human being to anybody else? And that's what alcohol does. It just, it just makes you into, makes me into this person that just wants to trash everything around me, including the people. There's no care or concern mm-hmm. for people. I mean, you've mentioned it before about your relationship and what the crux of what happened right and i i love what it says here it says drinking should never affect the way we coexist with the people we see on a regular basis you know especially those we love i mean not to read it by verbatim but that's Mm -hmm. i love that like this thing this drinking right what what we culturally uh approach as something to let steam off to relax to help you kind of this is what they tell you right this these are the things that are promised from drinking those things shouldn't affect the way that you deal with the people around you Mm -hmm. it it absolutely shouldn't i mean that's that's totally that's a that's a big sign right that's just you know the signs of drinking also i love the idea of the signs of drinking being that like you get drunk and steal stop signs and shit (laughs) it's not yeah that's that's totally unrelated but Mm -hmm. well it's just it's 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 not as big as that or it's not as grandiose it's not as ridiculous or stupid or something you see on cops you know it's like how are you harming the people around you certainly especially the close ones that you love but even just people in general what kind of human being are you when you go to the grocery store right exactly i'm not saying that waiting in line is easy for anybody well it's like it's selfish and self-centered you know you become Mm -hmm. so focused on yourself that everybody else becomes peripheral they all or they all orbit you like you're the fucking sun or something you know like at least that's how I felt about me, you mm-hmm. know, like everybody needed to get in line with my conga line. I'm the leader of the conga line. God damn it. And that orbit is not like wanting to be gravitationally pulled toward you. It's almost like I need to stay far enough away from you and yeah. it's to have to walk around your alcoholism constantly. Right. <clears throat> yeah, it sucks. Here's another one that's <laughs> um, that's pretty self-explanatory, but uh, telling lies. Have you ever lied about your drinking habits to others? Um, yes, a, 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 a little bit, dude, a little bit, mm-hmm. mostly a, a lot. Yeah, a little bit, a lot. So it's just plain and simple. Do you hide it? You know, the the example that I give and this is sort of a, um, this is not like, were you drinking tonight? And I go, no. Um, but the example that was a big epiphany to me was being the one in the kitchen during parties so that I could always have close, quick access to all the alcohol that was in the house. So I would always be happy to cook or clean or do something. So I could always pour myself a little bit more or a little bit heavier. And that is, that's more of a lie of omission. But if you have to lie about your habit, I mean, it's, it's, it was a pretty strong sign that I didn't even see it until later on. And I was like, Oh shit. Mm -hmm. 
That's right. exactly what I was doing. Or even the, the, the aftermath of your habits. Like for me, a lot of my line was based in being hung over and calling into work. Yeah. And basically mm-hmm. being like, oh, yeah, I got the stomach flu. And they're like, yeah, right. Dude. We saw you stomach fluing it up last <laughs> night. You know, <laughs> right. it, it was. It was a lot of lying. I'd call in constantly. And I have a type of job that like you don't you don't really have to call in you if you have nothing going on just don't go in you know but i let a lot of people down you know people had paid money to come see me so i could Mm -hmm. you know tattoo them and i was just like nah i'm too hungover i've got a strep throat just for today you know so that was a lot of my lying the act of drinking itself i made such a part of my persona that i was like fuck yeah i'm a drunk whatever like shove off if you don't like it you don't got to be friends with me you know but but the aftermath of the people i owed a service to or the people i owed responsibility to those are the ones i lied to more than like close personal friendships you know yeah yeah that's how i knew that was Mm -hmm. uh, that was my sign (laughs) yeah it's um (laughs) there was plenty of them plenty of them um number five is uh making excuses yeah, I love this one mm-hmm. actually. Yeah. Justifying excessive drinking. Oh yeah. I was dude. that was like that was a precursor, you know. I was I I'm pretty sure I would wake up hungover justifying that was that was the immediate justification for needing to get drunk today. I'd yeah. wake up feeling justified. Right. <clears throat> dude, my thing was like I would always convince myself that I was going to quit drinking for a little while or take a break, but then it would always be like, well, it's so-and-so's birthday next week. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I've got to go to a christening. And I'm like, who the fuck gets drunk at a christening? I do. I do. And, fuck it. and then it was like, it was like St. Patrick's Day was after that. And I hate St. Mm-hmm. Patrick's Day, but I still got to drink in the house. And then we're going to have a carne asada on Friday. So I got to drink at the barbecue. And then, do you know what I mean? The excuses for me were lining up reasons to get hammered. And of course, the whole hangover, like drinking a tall boy because I'm hungover. And then, of course, dude, I'm, I'm me. So the tall boy's more than one. You know, it's like two or three. And then by that time, it's time to start drinking whiskey, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. These weren't even excuses. I mean, they were, I'm just thinking about, I mean, of course, I would make excuses to for any purpose to have a party. I would try to rally yeah. people to get together and be like hey man oh God. we're gonna throw a party or it's such and such birthday or you know we did this thing we did it every year or it was like the pisces party so then it became this annual thing with all my friends and it was a great thing i don't i don't want to i don't want to discount it um, we had fun we had a lot of fun but it became this like epic let's get fucked but it wasn't the epic let's get fucked wasn't any more getting fucked than the usual you know what i mean right <laughs> didn't then wednesday yes yeah so that was definitely um just ex- and even excuses to myself without even bringing anybody into it sitting at home alone and having like hemming and hawing and trying to be good and then going well maybe i'll just have some beer and maybe i'll just go to the store and get a six pack oh and yeah i won't yeah. go out tonight but I'll, I'll go get a bottle of vodka. Well, I'll just get a little bottle of vodka. Well, maybe I should get two little bottles of vodka in case I just need a little bit more than a little bit. And then right. I get two little bottles of vodka and a six pack of, you know, some sort of fruity beer because I used to like to drink ciders and stuff with the straight vodka. And I get a bottle uh, of like some kind of white wine just in case, you know, I don't know like what I'm, what kind of mood I'm going to be in. But the mood was I was just going to like hang out at home and fucking watch deadwood and get drunk or something you right. know again or law and order law and order marathon. law and order dude <laughs> don don yeah it was the svu the fucking iced tea yeah so making all these sort of justifications in my own head absolutely <clears throat> yeah so 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 far it's like i love it justification is a great way to put it a justification to continue with not the habit but the compulsion to continue drinking mm-hmm. the justification of it it's just like telling lies is also another version of uh, maybe not a justification, but it's all these things that rail us into the compulsion of drinking. It's this list that we're reading is just mm-hmm. this compilation of things that allow you to continue to be compulsive within your drinking, you know? Yeah. That you tell yourself and everyone around you. Yeah. <laughs> Especially Woo! yourself, yeah. right? And because every, yeah. nobody else mm-hmm. is convinced. So you got to keep telling them. <laughs> <clears throat> What's the next one? Bad, Bad company. Bad company. Which is an awesome band, <laughs> yes. but you know, I don't know if a bad, like if you listen to Bad Company, you're an alcoholic. No, but 
Um, but I, <laughs> here's the, that here's joke the just thing like, like landed. Like, well, <laughs> well, no, I, I think here's the thing. I, I read this one and I thought I have some really great friends. I have a lot of really great friends who are hardcore alcoholics. And, um, in my opinion, uh, yeah, you know, and I have a lot of them that we never took a break from each other. We never were like, I, you know, like, oh, I had, I had a, I had a thing that happened. I was in a relationship that was very, very toxic. I mean, not that I was, I was totally toxic. I'm not blaming that relationship, but I kind of took a break from my friends for a year for all the wrong reasons, but I never stopped drinking. It was never about alcoholism, you know? And, um, so I certainly think that I had people in the past where I would have people who I'd simply just drank with or people that I would meet at bars and then that's the only place that we ever went to or people that right. it was like <clears throat> people I would never associate with otherwise. But I knew that they would want to drink until, you know, 6 a.m. with me. Right. <clears throat> so I don't want I just I guess what I want to say is, is that you can still have friends, you know, and your your alcoholism can, you know, your friendship can supersede that alcoholism. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that everybody that you are drinking with yeah. now or it's garbage is yeah, garbage that's not what you're saying. yeah like <laughs> so, fuck them they're off the island if you're trying to get yeah. good and your friends still like to go out and drink like it doesn't mean they're garbage now if you really want you know to get sober i mean you're gonna have to curb the amount of time you spend talking to them i mean you can you can attest to this just between you and i when you were when you were sober for yeah. a year and i wasn't yeah we didn't talk like we do now no, no, because you'd call and I'd be like, I'm in bed. I'm done with this shit. But you know what I do think about? I The way I perceive the bad company thing, too, is when you are in active alcoholism, you te tend to leave the door ajar to maybe situations that are a lot more dire than if you weren't in active alcoholism. I mean, we, we know people personally who we know a guy, you know, we know people through our drinking personally who have had to deal with some crazy shit. I mean, mm -hmm. we had... We had a close friend and all of us were drinking at the time who had a stalker who was like following him around and he, our, uh, our close friend ended up getting like almost grievously injured trying to fight this stalker off. Mm -hmm. And then they caught the guy across the street, like on the roof of a bar spying through the window. You know, it's those, those types of people that are unhinged and you may be unhinged yourself. You, I, hopefully mm -hmm. you're not that person in the other person's life, but you leave that door kind of ajar. I think more things, things that are worse become more permissible the more fucked up you are mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like yeah. if if you're on this kind of track and trying to improve your life then these these shitty things aren't as permissible you're like uh, uh i got a fucking boundary you can't cross that but you know when you're getting tight every night <laughs> you know what i'm saying like you're like all right it's okay it's Don't, okay no big know, deal just, yeah that sounds yeah. like you know, I'd prefer it if you didn't punch your girlfriend in front of me but i don't know you know like yeah you know. it's a mess yeah. So and that that's that was a random I don't know anybody who did that, you know. No. Not that I can think of. But you know, is this an example? So it's it's not a declaration of of, you know, admonishment toward your friends if you're trying to get sober and and yeah. they aren't. You know, you just have to focus on yourself because nobody else is going to I'll tell you that much. That much I know for a fact for myself is that nobody else is going to look after me better than I am myself. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to be concerned. Everyone's too busy doing their own thing, man. You can't you can't think that you know, somebody else is going to be there to handle your biz for you. This next one is a big one for me is uh, no company from bad company yeah. to no company. That's when bad company cancels at the venue. <laughs> you can't go see them. <laughs> right. Nice. There you go. So you brought it. You brought the joke back. That's I'm good. Back That's on good. It. That's we call good. that a callback in the industry. Nice. A callback. Um, this was one that was big for me near the end of my active alcoholism because I was doing all of my drinking alone, um, unless you, you know, count Facebook, uh, which I'd rather not. Um, but it's kind <laughs> kind enough to remind me of all of me posting just music videos from YouTube from well, nine I did years that ago. Too. Oh, my God. I did that. I had to get rid of the Facebook because they were like four years ago. You decided to, you know, post every Cure song you ever knew. <sighs> Oh, anyway, continue. Memories. I'm sorry. I just had a relatable memory. No, no, with you. it's good. Yeah. It's good. So that's all. I mean, I just think that that was that was a big sign. That was maybe one of the biggest ones. Was that 
I'm doing this all alone and I keep doing yeah. this all alone and I have right. fewer and fewer people to reach out to. Right. So if that's something that was my jam mm-hmm. back in the day, drinking alone, man, I made a sport out of it at one point, you know, that isolation, you know, and what it would truly really be alone because the wife and the kid would leave and I would be truly alone and I would make sure I was stocked up like a dude in a cabin out <clears> in the fucking <throat> hills, you know, like, do you know what I'm saying? Like I needed like my beef jerky, my fucking, all that, all the accoutrement. Next on drunk preppers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like, I need four bags of Oberto's. Two cartons of camels. Oh, God. You know, two handles of, of bourbon. That'll get me through three or four days. Mm-hmm. No, that was probably five days. Yeah. This, well, the cigarettes will last longer. <clears throat> Anyhow, yeah, no company, man. Drinking drinking alone, <clears throat> right? Because then, once again, culturally, we look at alcohol as a social drug, right? You're not administering mm-hmm. it to medicate yourself. That's not the idea. At least that's what they're trying to tell you is you do not administer this thing to medicate yourself. You need this to lubricate and warm up and dance the fucking, you know, the salsa with somebody and <laughs> garden party it up, you mm-hmm. know, but if you're in your house watching Law and Order, Special Victims <laughs> Unit, and then, ho- and then, and then, you know, finishing that off with a couple of episodes of Hoarders, you know, like, mm-hmm. just to feel good about yourself. Bottom. Yeah, and you're killing a bottle of Tito's, you know, like that's rough, man. That's that's definitely get out of not my social. house. Uh, but I, Three you know, I have ago. a hard time. I, it's so mm. weird though because it's I I have a difficult time with the idea of alcohol being having to be this social thing, right? Mm-hmm. I'm saying don't drink alone, don't drink at all. If you listen to this podcast, I'd say don't just don't drink tonight. But the social idea of that it's acceptable within a social circle but unacceptable alone when it seems like we're kind of avoiding the fact that like you're medicating regardless you know and medicating is a raw is a is a it's a funny choice of words that we we have yeah. chosen to use because it's poison it's not medicine right. it's not medicine right. and that's that's you know? my yeah that's my my choice of words because it's no, not medicine but i mean that's that's what everybody says that's that's sort of the right. nomenclature of it is um i'm Word. self-medicating and it's like well but it's not medicine and it's not helping if you were self-medicating you would be i don't know taking vitamins <laughs> something man getting some yeah. spirulina and some get a yeah. good night's sleep eat a fucking banana <laughs> something you know? Yeah. Um, number the next one is uh, poor performance. Um, yeah. And I think I mean, we go we we can harken back if I might to um, calling in sick at work. Um, yeah. I would do yeah. it. Um, oh man, I was made of it, man. Oof. Uh, it's it's and I would or I would go to work so hungover and dizzy and blurry and probably still drunk. I have a memory of one time I'm working with this guy. He was my manager. He was a friend of mine too. He still is. And he was my manager at the time. And I remember, I feel like it was a Tuesday. And I think I was like, went out with a friend of ours and we, we went, we went to the city and we ate a bunch of food and we were like hammered drinking for net, like at the very end of the night until two in the morning. And I had to get up the next day and I was at work. And I just remember him looking at me and going, dude, you really suck today. What's going on? Cause it was a super mm-hmm. busy day at work. And I was like, I'm sorry, man, I'm just hung over. And I was like, and it was just like he was kind of joking about it, but he was right. I really did suck that day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I mean, how many times did I walk into the tattoo shop looking like uh, Vincent D'Onofrio, Men in Black, when the bug is wearing the man skin, you know? And I'm like, give me sugar water. You know, like that's how I'd look like that, just bloated and just the skin mm. falling off. And it was, uh, it was rough. It was, I could not imagine some. A poor 18 year old kid coming in getting their very first tattoo is this monumental thing for them this rite of passage and i fucking dribble out you know mm-hmm. and i'm just like you know just a fucking shit show like let's do it kid <laughs> bring any sugar water <laughs> so we're gonna go on to the physical uh signs of alcoholism um Probably, yeah, number one these, high right? tolerance Who's ever, yeah. who's ever drank a full bottle of booze and not really felt its effects? Raise your hands. <laughs> me. <laughs> we're both, yeah, um, me as well, yeah. That's a, that's a big sign, man. If you, if you, if you can, if you can out drink everybody, you know, I think there's that, that sort of, that, that idea of drinking a lot is manly or yeah, a masculine. sign of strength. Yeah. Which I did. Yeah. Uh, I felt yeah, that so way for I. a very long time. Well, dude, and you and I are like two poets. Like we're like two artistic <laughs> people. We are not physically strong. We are like dudes who are into art and music. Like mm-hmm. we bonded over our love of Morrissey. 
Like, this is true. of course, we're both going to look at drinking way too much as a masculine endeavor. You know, like, yeah, we're still manly. Mm-hmm. We, we don't have to catch a ball, but I can fucking kill this thing right here. You know, mm-hmm. like, so. yeah. But but that that's definitely a sign. If, if you're the last one wandering around being like, what, am I the only one here? You know, mm-hmm. that's... that could be your sign. All right. Next one. No limit. No limit, Jerry. No limit, Holden. Uh, no, no limit. No um, limit, soldiers. This was no limit, soldiers. <clears throat> Is that a thing? A master P, dude. Uh, yeah, master P. I don't know if master this... P, dude. Master P. It's a rap thing. You would understand. It's a rap thing. <laughs> but so this no is limits. not a rap thing, though. On Blacking the list, blacking yeah. out. Um, I certainly was one who had no limit. I never, I never put a limit on it. Or if I ever did, we used to joke uh, with a friend of ours, be like, "Yeah, I'll meet you for a drink." And it was like add this drink. thing, add drink, like I'm going to have one drink and that's yeah. it. And that never happened. Yeah. Not even close. It was, I mean, blacking out was the goal of the night. You know? Right. Yeah. So. I mean, if you're physically, yeah, the physical symptoms are actually a lot more, I don't know, a, lo- a little, well, no, I guess they're both equally telling it, even this, mm-hmm. you know, the social symptoms with the physical, I mean, if you're drinking so much, you're yeah knocking yourself unconscious like that's alcohol poisoning (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah that's not like tea sandwiches and chilling Mm -hmm. that's not you know that's straight up alcohol poisoning yeah which i never thought of it as when i was doing it no no it was just it was just a symptom of a good time right (laughs) word yeah i got so (laughs) fucked up i was doing the fucking humpty dance in the front Mm -hmm. yard you know of somebody else's house somebody else at eight in the morning crying (laughs) waiting for a cab you know it's your chance um, and this goes into the next one, which is losing your memory. So blackouts. Right. Um, I, I am, I was a big fan of blacking out. I don't know if I was a fan of blacking out. It just kind of happened. It was just, again, it was just what happened. It was what, what the goal was. There was never like, I better be careful. Something might happen, you know, and which ironically, I would always say, man, I don't want to smoke any weed because I just feel like I get too out of control. I like to stay in control. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, I thought yeah. that, you know, drinking yeah. a fifth of whiskey was being in control. So, well, I, I think there's this, uh, you know, I, I'd like to uh, kind of address this whole uh, um, non-alcoholic version of blacking out where I think in normal society, they think blacking out is you drink until you go to sleep or you faint, you lose consciousness. Mm-hmm. The actual reality of blacking out is that you just don't remember you know what I'm saying? Like even like younger drinkers would be like, yeah, I blacked out. That was crazy. And I'm like, no, dude, you drank so much. You fucking gave yourself amnesia. So, so you were still up and about and walking around and saying things. And like my wife says, you were making things happen. You were putting <laughs> things in action. Mm-hmm. You were still doing things. You were still active. You just got so fucked up. You could not remember what you did. Like your brain just, there's a lapse that's gone. But we don't even, yeah. Yeah, you poison. So it's not just drinking till you fall asleep. That's passing out, you know. At least mm-hmm. in my opinion, yeah. You know, blacking out to me has always been those loud vertical naps. Yes. Where you don't know what's happening. You're just walking around being loud. You know, a loud vertical <clears throat> nap. You're making shit happen. Never positive shit either. Yeah, you never positive. It's never it's positive. drinking. No, it's drinking so much alcohol that your your mind is now. And I don't know the exact science behind it, but your mind is literally incapable of creating new memories. So Word. you have you have <laughs> shut down a part of your of your mind that makes memories that you've had yes. so much to drink. Yeah, mm. dude, no one ever blacked out and cured cancer. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like no one ever blacked out right? and figured out the fucking human genome. Mm-mm. Like no, nothing good happens in a blackout. It's all negative. Yeah. No bueno. Yeah. No bueno, big guy. No bueno. Uh drinking on the daily. That's Which is yeah. That's pretty fairly obvious. If you, you know, I I was, I would do it every day near the end. And some days it wouldn't be a lot. And some, some weeks even it would be kind of moderated Mm -hmm. and just enough to get through and just enough to get by. But it was every single day. And I don't know. I mean, if you, because I know that I feel like you had more rules around it than I did. I had like you would set boundaries. Well, yeah, the rules which might be another sign itself. My work, right? (laughs) Absolutely, because what normal drinker has a rule like is like, oh well, 
I can't, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I can only drink six tonight, like that weird show of moderation or like, oh, I, I, if I have one beer, I can't go to work because I knew for me it was never one drink and then back to work. You know, I could never have like a whiskey lunch and then come back into the shop. You know, there are mm-hmm. definite rules. Never before 5 p.m. Because I was just delaying the inevitable. I always thought I was never in denial until you mention it. And now that I think about it, I was absolutely in denial because I was like, I don't have a problem if I'm not drinking at 3 p.m. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, nah, man. I mean, if if you're drinking from 5 till 4 in the morning, like there's some some, some shit is amiss. <laughs> well, yeah. And drinking on the daily, that was, that was the purpose of every day. I'd wake up and I would well, yeah. work my whole day around when I could have the next drink. When I could have the first the, drink. Right. It was the bow on your day. It was the bow on your, your little <laughs> wrapping on that present of the day. You know, it's what a shitty mm-hmm. present. <laughs> what a shitty uh, present. What a shitty present. This present's going like, to make me pee my mm, bed. Mm-hmm. I like so, this next this, one. Yeah. This is when we, ta- this, we, we touched on this earlier. Risky business. Bam. Yeah. I mean, you talked about leaving the door open a crack for things to happen right. and for you to spend mm-hmm. time with the wrong people. And what happens right. when you spend time with the wrong people? You get into the wrong things. Yeah, Rebecca Demornay's pimp steals your fucking crystal egg, dude, and you got to get it back, dude. Uh, which which show is that? That's from the movie Risky Business. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Cruise. I'm sorry. Hooks up with Rebecca Demornay. She's a prostitute, and her pimp steals the egg. Mm-hmm. So he's got to like, or somebody steals the egg. I don't know. I'm not recalling it correctly. I used to drink a lot. I don't know if you know that. Bachman Turner Overdrive. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but yeah, don't leave that door open. Risky business, man. It's it's very easy. I mean, I have made a lot of very poor decisions in 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 moments of absolute drunkenness where I was like, ah, what's the worst that can happen? I know that mm-hmm. whenever I'm saying what's the worst that can happen, um, I'm probably looking for the worst that that can happen. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um the next one's appearance change. Are you slovenly in your dress or how you, you know, if you're falling behind on your hygiene because of your drinking, that's a very kind way that they put it. I like yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Are you falling yeah. behind? If, you need to catch up on your, on brushing your teeth and combing right. your hair. Yeah. <clears throat> Are you bloated AF? Yeah, you bloated <laughs> AF? Because I was. Yeah, you, me too. Yeah. Um, I'm bloated. So it's just, it's those little things. And I, I know that I, the, I've got pictures of me side by side of when I was drinking and when I was not. And I was definitely bloated. And um, yeah, I mean, and I was somebody who always prided myself on like fixing up and looking sharp and dressing yeah. nice, you know, and mm-hmm. you did too. And, um, but even again, near the end, man, it was just like, I just don't fucking care. Whatever shirt yeah. is on is next to me is what I'm going to put on. Yeah. And I'm going to go. It was blast off of books. It was that t-shirt you had. <laughs> I, did that I gave you that, that said blast, blast off, of off of books. It had cigarette burns in it. It was, <laughs> and that was Johnny's like, and that was his house coat. That I was like, I you remember coat. that shirt. That, that Dude, was yours. I, I know. Oh. And I, I put a couple cigarette burns in it too. And then you like adopted it and it became your house coat. You were just like, that was your all, mm-hmm. all around, all purpose. Let's put it on. Just. Ugh. Put it on. Get down to the Valero. Mm. We got to get down to that Valero, mm. man. Get a six pack and some cigarettes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, withdrawal symptoms, Jerry. What can you tell yeah. me about withdrawal symptoms? Did you have withdrawal when you? Um... When I quit, it was. If I did, I feel like it was very mild because I would have been. I was. I feel I was very, very fortunate in those early days. Um, yeah. The first few days were pretty awful. Um, but I did not go through anything bad. I had the nightmares. Uh, I, you know, there was, there was, there were nightmares and there were sleepless nights. If the, if the two can exist, I think somehow they yeah. did. They can. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. They can. That's definitely withdrawal. I got, I got them. I didn't get them as severe as other people. Thank God. I'm so grateful for that. But yeah, I got the shakes. I got the, sw- I sweat, man. I used to sweat so much. And then I, those, those first couple of weeks, man, I would like soak the bed. Like I was running a fever. It was so strange. And I shivered, I would shiver. I would have tiny tremors. And I always thought during my drinking days, I always Mm -hmm. attributed it to low blood sugar. I'd wake up and just (laughs) tremble and I'd be like, oh man, I need to get some protein or some sugar, you know, not realizing that my body was like screaming at me, you know? 
and I'd, I sweat so much. I had to buy medical grade uh, deodorant or medical grade antiperspirant because I, I could sweat through a suit jacket. Man, that was gangsters. Fuck. That was part of the withdrawal, though. That's so once again, which is a very obvious sign of like there's an issue with your alcohol intake, because if your body is going through physical withdrawal when it's not taking it, that mm-hmm. means you have now passed on from casual drinker to physically dependent. Yeah. Which leads to the emotional dependence, you know, not for everybody, but for <laughs> lots of people, lots of people, you know. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to go on to some of the emotional signs. Speaking of nice uh, segue there, my friend. All right. We got um, this last denial is yeah. so strong. So, so strong. Um, I was in denial for a very long time, even though I admitted it, there were things and I would, you know, again, I, 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 I would always say it like, yeah, I'm an alcoholic, whatever. But I didn't, I was never, I was in denial at how much it was actually hurting me. I just felt like, oh, I'm strong enough. I can handle some hangovers, no big deal. But it was it was hurting me in a lot more ways than I didn't even realize until I got sober and was able to be like, oh my God, I was in a lot of pain. Yeah, yeah. My denial was a lot of, that's not me, that's the other guy. Mm-hmm. This is the other guy. That's the other guy that dies in the car accident. It's the other guy that shoots himself in the head. It's the other guy that fucking loses his wife and family. Not me. That's not me, dude. I'm not going to win that lottery. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That was a lot of my denial. That and the denial within how severe the habit, not the habit, how severe the compulsion, the obsession had become. You know, where I'd see myself doing things and go, oh, fuck, you, you got a problem. And then the alcoholic mind would take over immediately and be like, nah, it's all good. That's not you, dude. That's the other guy. Don't even stress it. You're just fu- you're just a heavy drinker. You're fine. That's all. Yeah. You're fine, dude. Yeah. You're all right. <laughs> you're not all right. <laughs> when, in fact, I was not all right. Shame, Jerry. Now, that's a... Yo. Yeah. I think dude. anybody who has touched any sort of drinking problem in their time has felt shame the walk of shame the you know the phone calls of shame checking text messages and phone calls what they call the emotional hangover the regret i can't remember what it was called the regret hangover the shame hangover yeah you know like mm -hmm. just that or even being ashamed of things you can't remember that you don't even know if you did or didn't do Oh, yeah. Just like, oh, God, what happened? And then peace is coming back or saying things to people or. Yeah. Making out with someone's wife. Mm hmm. You probably shouldn't have done that. No. Not you. I'm just saying as an example. (laughs) Probably not me either. I probably shouldn't have done that as well because I have. But yeah. um, Yeah. Those things. are. (sighs) Yeah. If if you're feeling if you're feeling shame about anything, I mean, there's certainly something. It's not it's not a uh, it's not a happy place to be. No. So that's something to think about. Um, Are you concerning others with your alcoholism, with your with your alcohol intake? Yeah. Um, How do others (laughs) feel about it? How do your coworkers and your your family and your friends and anybody else? I mean, I know that and I again, it's such a selfish disease that you don't think about others. And then so they're having this whole other life where they have to deal with your stupid ass. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, like yeah. that sucks, man. Yep. I was calling my sisters drunk at two in the morning crying. Mm-hmm. And then my sister would be like, go to rehab. And I'd be like, fuck no, fuck you. And I'd hang up on her. And then she'd call my mom and be like, you know, when is Jerry going to fucking chill out? Like Jerry needs to quit. We need to have an intervention or something. And then my mom would always say he's got to find his bottom on his own. It's not up to us, you know, but the fact that they were having those conversations behind my back, behind the scenes yeah. was uh, really, really eye opening to me. Then they didn't tell me they were having these conversations till after I got sober, you know, and then my sister was like, you know, I've spoken to mom numerous times regarding <laughs> you and your alcoholism, you know, and uh, I did not realize that there's all this shit going on behind me. You know, that I, I, I just was so self-absorbed. I was so fucking self-absorbed that I didn't realize that people actually gave a shit mm-hmm. you know that they were worried or irritated or fucking pissed off or you know all, all negative stuff nobody was ever like jerry drank a whole fifth he's doing great you know what i mean like <laughs> it was never <laughs> isn't that no, I, isn't that a trip like what you just said like that i was so surprised to find out that other people gave a shit or like yeah yeah because i didn't give a shit 
about myself, so why would anybody else? Yeah, like, the fuck? you know, yeah. I, I and I can't. I came across that too, where it's just this like self-loathing that's you know chewing its way inside of you, and you're just like, well, yeah. nobody else cares, and you're like, oh, what you mean? Oh, there's people that love me, and then you're like, yeah. And even even They're... then, you're like, why? You know, and you get defensive. What do they want? What do they want? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What so, do you want? Yeah. Speaking of which, yeah. the next one is um, uh, imbalance of emotion. Yeah, dude. So that's also one of my jams too mm-hmm. back then. Even now, a little bit, but more so back then. As Homer yeah. would say, the dizzying highs and the terrifying lows and the creamy middles. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> dude. Homer Simpson's got a lot of good quotes regarding alcoholism, right? Mm-hmm. The cause of and source of all of our problems. What is it? The Al- solution and source of all of our problems. Mm-hmm. Is that what it is? Yeah. <clears throat> um, but. Being, are you, are you, yeah, are you, are you manic? Are you depressive? Are you up? Are you down? Yep. And then amplify that. Pour, mm-hmm. pour some alcohol on that. It'll absolutely amplify it. So even if you sober, you already have some um, emotional uh, instability. I don't like the word instability, but just some emotional. I'm going to use instability, but not in a detrimental way. But like you have an emotional instability and then you just amplify it mm-hmm. so much. It's like a megaphone for all that negativity. I was absolutely zero to a hundred every fucking day, man. Like I would go from completely placid to like throwing things out of the back, off the, out of the back wall, out of the back window, you know, onto the back porch, smashing shit in the backyard, screaming and yelling and pointing fingers, you know? And then once I had been placated, it was like normal. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was placid again. It was just such hard. You were zero hard, to a hundred at the top minutes. of the show over a buffalo clutch. Dude, see what I'm saying? But I've let it go. That's <laughs> yes. the thing I've learned within using my program and and my recoveries that I've I've let it go now. I'm, as soon as we're done with this podcast, I'm getting that fucking buffalo, dude. <laughs> um, I was I, me too because I would be like <laughs> I would be like uh, top of the top of the tops like out with people and buying drinks and having a good time and like just absolutely loving it and i would come home and you know and i'd be with with friends and either with you or with another you know close friend and i'd be so dark and you get to the point of crying and yelling that you're inconsolable there's nothing that anyone can say that is going to make you stop and it's like just go to fucking bed john yeah. Just mm-hmm. go to fucking bed. Stop crying. Just, just go to bed. <clears throat> There's nothing anyone can do. You are inconsolable. And so I, I just know that in my experience, I definitely was imbalanced. Yeah. Um, yes. It's incredibly severely. And not just you. I mean, both of us, mm-hmm. or, you know, or, you know, yeah, um, absolutely. And then to, wow. you know, one of the other things with, with alcoholism I found with me is that, you know, you're always trying to protect yourself. And we, we, a lot of, a lot of alcoholism, at least I should say my alcoholism comes from, uh, or in part was caused by a lot of childhood trauma. And so mm-hmm. you're very defensive and you're always trying to protect yourself. And I, I don't want to speak too heavily into all the psychology of, you know, the inner child and the ego and all that stuff. But the next one is like defensiveness, you know? And so you're always defensive. And I would, I'd be like defensive about how much alcohol I needed, defensive about how much I was drinking, defensive about whether or not I, you know, whether an obligation was really necessary or not, or if I forgot something, why I forgot it. So I was constantly trying to defend my alcoholism as it was, you know, slowly or quickly killing me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think just being defensive about any of your habits in general may be a sign that the habit may be... Un- unhealthy that they're not you know. yeah, yeah that they're not serving your your better good your better yeah. good your higher yeah, good a, your higher good your better good your better good <laughs> your is better good a oxymoron mm-hmm. no not an oxymoron anyway your better higher good yeah they they yeah if you have to d- defend any of your habits really mm-hmm. you know I, I, within reason you know if you, your wife comes in and she's like what's with all these fucking model airplanes and you're like well, this is the only thing that makes me feel alive barbara you know like <laughs> that might not be that bad of a deal unless mm-hmm. you're you know s- selling shit you need for model airplanes i don't know that's a weird tangent but i'm basically i'm saying like yeah anytime you get defensive about those things it really should be time to reassess all this whole uh, the, all this whole list is just like look at what you're doing 
it doesn't necessarily mean that if you do any of these things, then you're fucking hopeless. That's I, because I would read these lists while I was drinking because I be, was an alcoholic during the internet age. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So like I would look up all these tests. I'd look up this one, the AA test, like all of them. And then I'd always fucking win the prize and be like, congratulations, Jerry, you're a fucking alcoholic. And then I thought it was a death sentence. I really did. I was like, this is what I am now, huh? Fuck, you know. And, uh, but it, you know, like you, know. you said, it's a series of it's habits. Yes. And habits can be changed. Absolutely. So, right. That the habit doesn't define you as a person. No. No. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. Even though we use the label of alcoholic, but and that's a whole other argument for another podcast. But I personally like <laughs> the label of alcoholic. I I know that you know. If I had cancer, although they're not the same thing, but I would, as an, as an example, if I had cancer and I survived it, I would like to know, everybody to know that this is what I did to survive my cancer. So this is, I'm an alcoholic because A, this condition is always here, and B, like, this is what I've done so far to survive my alcoholism. So far. Yeah, so far. You know? yeah. And there, there anyway, will probably yeah. be more. And yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then this last one, they talk about, um, emotional withdrawal symptoms and so are you depressed without alcohol are you you know are you are you low do you on the days that you don't drink do you uh do you sleep all day you know did you i mean i i know that i would have those days in during drinking where it was like i wasn't gonna drink for whatever reason or i was too hungover or i couldn't Uh uh-huh I couldn't afford another two day hangover. So I would fight through the one I had and not drink, but I would sleep all day. Like I yeah. would take like Tylenol PMs or whatever it was just to kind of mm-hmm. sleep it off if I could, assuming I didn't have something to do. Um, but that withdrawal, that emotional withdrawal, are you? Oh, yeah. Dude, <clears throat> early recovery for me was like the worst breakup I've ever had. Mm. Honestly, emotionally hit me like I somebody I loved dearly was gone. And not only were they gone, but they were fucking around with everybody else in front of me. <laughs> that's good. That's <laughs> you good. You know what I mean? Like it was like a, there's a song that's going to go on the playlist, but there's a part in the song where he's like, please don't go. I love you so I'll eat you whole. And I love that whole line. It's like from where the wild things are. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, please don't go. We love you. We'll fucking eat you. And I always felt like it was this conversation between me and booze you know was the worst breakup ever because i i had to say goodbye to it but at the same point i knew if i had it it would fucking eat me it would just eat me it would eat up my entire being in person yeah. so the emotional depression of the depression of the sadness the fucking utter loss was really profound in the beginning now i look back just like any other hard breakup i've had with any other person and been like what the fuck were you thinking you know like mm-hmm. dude you didn't notice you know like that that person you were with was a mess you know you dodged a bullet but in the moment it was like pro fucking found dude it was hard i've heard i've heard people uh have written goodbye letters to alcohol i don't know if you ever did that no i did somebody would say like you know they'd be like dear vodka and so they would basically or dear alcohol and list all the things we had a really good time things don't work out for me and that sort of thing and then either right you know symbolically either mail it or burn it or whatever uh, and that's sort of yeah. releasing all that thing you know there's a lot about there's something to be said for me about writing things down and being able to put them pen and paper and kind of once they're there then they don't have to live in my head anymore that's great advice i should have done that i never did i just suffered through it like i did everything in the beginning <laughs> i was just like ah, oh, this will make me stronger mm-hmm. and now i feel like my relationship with alcohol is well there is none but we're civil we can be in the same room mm-hmm. and not fucking be at each other's throats it's like divorced parents you know like we can kick it now on christmas i just don't have to talk to you or be around you yeah we'll just you know pass the potatoes thank you you know but like yeah that depression in the beginning that emotional withdrawal was so fucking profound. So profound. Yeah. Now I'm thinking about it. A thousand yard stare up here. Like, wow, man, that was my rock, but it wasn't, it was such a shaky, shitty, Mm -hmm. awful fucking garbage relationship. That was just poisoning me from the inside, you know, emotionally. Yeah. Fuck the physical aspect. It poisoned my personality for such a long period of time that I now have to like, I don't have to, but now I work a program, my own personal program to be able to cope with my life. You know, Mm -hmm. because the thing I used to cope was a false. It was like a false idol. It didn't work. No, it didn't work. Nah, nah. 
It worked for a little while. It worked just enough. Just enough. For my, yeah, for my stupid brain to be like, this will always work. And Mm -hmm. it was, no. And it was my fucking, it was my precious, dude. Lord of the Rings shit, you know? It was, it's kind of like those. (laughs) (laughs) It's true, man. It totally, it's like those, those old timey, you know, flying machines where they put a backpack with some wings on it. And they, right. you know, they'd jump off the cliff and be like, I'm flying, yes. I'm flying, I'm flying. Oh, the, the entire time they're just like falling to the ground. Right, right. Because you're like not flying, bro. You're falling. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That was that, yeah, that just... momentary feeling of like l- being exalted and lifted and happy and uh-huh. joyous. And you're like, oh, yes, this is great. And never looking down as the, the floor is coming <laughs> at you. Came at you. At... Temporarily aloft. Yes, exactly. 32 feet yeah. per second or whatever yeah. it is. I think out of all of them, that emotional... I mean, there's a couple of these on the list that still kind of ring... Don't ring true mm-hmm. for me, but are, every single one's incredibly relatable, but some of them still ring a little bit, even in current sober behaviors, recovery behaviors, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, because this is a work in progress, man. I, I Part of me kind of hopes that I never achieve enlightenment because the work... In, it's always like once you've achieved enlightenment, you can go no higher. You know what I mean? Like it's maybe you, you just did, bro. Adjust. That's that's. Bam! <laughs> I gotta go let my wife know, honey. I'm gonna be up here for a while. I just John just said I achieved light and enlightenment. I achieved. John said I achieved nirvana. Is that cool? <laughs> Is that yeah. cool? No, take out the no. trash. Damn. Yeah. Um, I beat her. I did it earlier. Nice. Good for you. Yeah. Way to handle yeah. your priorities, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so I think. If, if I can say anything, in my opinion, if any of these things ring true to you, um, if any one of them rings true to you and you're fine with it, rock and roll, man. Like, I'm not, you know, I don't want to say that I'm not here to judge anybody on how they behave. But if you are concerned and you are not sure, reach out to somebody. Reach out to talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk to your whoever you whoever you feel close to and trust. And if there's nobody that you feel close to and you trust, there are so many resources in 2018. You can just Google it, you know, and you can find somebody. There are people, you know, next to phones right now that are waiting, waiting for your call. But do you know what I mean? Like whatever, go just, there's, there's, there's too many not to do it. So these are just some of the signs. They may apply to you. They may not. Some of them may and some other ones don't. And, you know, I mean, it's a life is a complicated, messy thing. And alcoholism makes it a lot more complicated and messy. So absolutely. I was trying to look up some alcoholism hotline numbers, but I think a lot of them go to rehabs. <laughs> but mm-hmm. I'm not sure. But there are there are numbers. There are there are lots of numbers you can which call. That, that may be something you're interested in or desire. Yeah. Um, but help is out there. And, you know, you can always drop us an email. A is for alcoholic. Yeah. Send us an email. We'll, com. We'll, uh, yeah. I'd be I'd happy like to to, uh, to reply. I do my best with folks online. Um, so, yeah, I think um, in conclusion, check it out. These are just some just some thoughts and just some some warning signs that I know I have found <laughs> in my own life. Right. Yeah. Same here shit man it's like i'm surprised they didn't just have a picture of me on the website i didn't i didn't print that part just, out but just yeah. point point my fingers mm-hmm. just yeah. i'm the guy finger guns finger guns bam, bam. yeah so. the old finger guns wagner thank you for listening to a is for alcoholic our music is by neglect You can find more of his music at neglectsound.bandcamp.com. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And contact us at aisforalcoholic at gmail.com.